Inherently, uh, we think of groups in terms of us and them. Humans have this tendency to just categorize groups in terms of us and them. Uh, we know this is incredibly strong. You can put people in red shirts and blue shirts and they'll just favor the red shirts more, right? They'll think they're more attractive, more intelligent, more trustworthy. And so this is kind of a crazy phenomenon that can be demonstrated with, with what we term as minimal groups. You just uh, make the distinction between the groups as minimal as possible and you can get these favoritism coming out. And once you decide that they're an outgroup, all these other psychological processes come into play, like this confirmation bias, right? False polarization effect. You exaggerate the differences between your groups. So we have this, and the issue is that a lot of these processes are happening very fast and under the surface. So these are unconscious processes that are driving us to conflict. I've also become really interested um, in you're making a bridge between those conflicts and the conflict, the ideological conflict that we have right now in our country between Democrats and Republicans, between left and right. I think it shares a lot of the hallmarks that I saw there. So one of them is um, there's uh, the groups are always inferring what's in the other group's mind, how they're thinking about us, and that often drives the animosity towards the other side. And you can see this remarkable disconnect um, because oftentimes what you think the other group is thinking about you is either completely wrong or is, at the very least dramatically exaggerated from what you think it is. And there's a lot of research to show this is the case, right? We, have, uh, we even have a false polarization effect that um, we think that the other group and our group are far more apart from each other on any given issue than they actually are. I don't know if you remember it, but after the march in Charleston, there was a, a very brief video of a white kid who took off his white supremacist shirt to avoid the crowd that was kind of imposing on him. And a bunch of people kind of caught him doing this. And what I saw on social media was that people were just laying on the shame. Um, oh, now you want to renounce this? And oh, look at this kid. You know, it was all uh, derisive. There was nobody saying, um, anything gentle. Nobody even trying an approach that would try to get through to somebody. And yet, when I talk to people who are former white supremacists, or when I see them on interviews, it's never somebody using snark or sarcasm or putting them down or shaming them that changes their mind. Right? Always it is a kind gesture from someone who they don't deserve it from. And you see this, it, it's just such a common um, pathway to getting people, even who are really hard and really involved in the movement, to change their mind. It's, it's a gentleness that you apply, and I think that we've totally lost sight of that. The interesting thing about inner group situations is um, what we are pre-wired to do, our intuitions actually are the exact opposite of what will help. So it feels good to write something that's really snarky on Facebook and it puts down the other side and shames them, right? We have the emotional apparatus to drive us to do that type of behavior. And it's exactly the wrong thing. That's going to drive people away from us. The, the hopeful part for me <laughs> is that yes, this is our evolutionary legacy. We have all these tendencies within us and they're unconscious so they're very difficult to address. But the other legacy we have is that the human brain is made to be incredibly flexible. 